I was a wide-eyed, fresh-faced 18-year-old from the country. I wouldn't say anything to a goose, and I'm really innocent and bashful. As a result, I didn't have many friends. I soon obtained a job as a waiter at a neighborhood restaurant that was honest with its clients. We were urged to talk constantly. This restaurant was quite small, and the staff welcomed me right away. We always went out for drinks after work, and I finally moved in with the people I was closest to. My employer was the only thing holding me back. Although he was a jerk, it appeared that he had a particular intention for me. Every week, out of roughly 35 staff, he would ride me down for the deep clean shifts on Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. That's a 6 a.m. to 12 p.m. shift spent peering under the grill hoods. Dishwashers ovens, restroom sinks, client toilets, and a 12 o'clock p.m. to 10 o'clock p.m. shift on top of that. Keeping in mind that I still had college to prepare for. He would berate me, publicly make sarcastic remarks, make fun of me in staff meetings, make me go get his coffee, make his lunch, and always make fun of my financial condition. He knew I was starving for money, and I believe he did all of these things in the hopes that I would never give my notice, and that I was a complete slacker who would never speak up. I grew more confident with time, even advancing up the ranks. She eventually rose to the positions of head waitress, staff trainer, shift coordinator, and supervisor. Of course, this meant I'd be working closer to my boss, who had become even more irritable. I finished college with honors and was offered a job at a hospital about 200 miles away. I was studying to become a nurse, so the time arrived for me to turn in my notice. As my employer said goodbye, he stated, I wish I could say I would miss you, but I won't. Have a good time wiping people's butts for a living. He even went so far as to schedule me for my farewell party and then attend it personally. It's oak since I pushed through and closed the shop early so I could leave. So I said my goodbyes, packed my belongings, and moved away to begin my job, and I'm having a terrific time. I return home every other month to see everyone, and we have a fantastic catch-up, despite the fact that my supervisor would deny me the obligatory 30% company discount and eventually bar me from entering the store. It's a good thing there's a coffee shop right next door where we could all congregate. The most opulent nightclub in town and the restaurant chain are hosting a party, and my best friend, who has advanced to the position of first assistant manager, has invited me back. Free beverages and admission, all night long dance, and the opportunity to see all of my buddies at once. I tell them I'll go, but I'll pay for my beverages because I no longer work there and shouldn't be eligible for freebies. My old boss learns about it and threatens to have me hauled out by the cops if I go. I'm disappointed since I've traveled all the way to see everyone only to be informed I'm not welcome. My companions leave the club and meet me at the bar next door, where we continue to have a good time. As fate would have it, I got a big sum of money from my grandmother a month later. Not millions of dollars, but enough to get by for the rest of my life. I'm not a showy woman. I don't own an automobile. I already own a charming, modest cottage in the suburbs that I purchased and decorated myself. I don't have any interests. I dislike flying. I am devoted to my career as a nurse and have kept my fortunes private. For the time being, I'm investing and donating to charities. Oh, and I took my parents on their 35th wedding anniversary honeymoon. I got a new car for my best friend, the manager. It was the least I could do after mom took me under her wing all those years ago, and we slummed it in a cramped student dorm. However, the following time I went back to my previous restaurant, my manager approached me and gave me a big hug. Weird. He inquires about my job. It's going swimmingly. Weirder. He asks if I've had lunch. Would I like to have lunch at your house just to catch up? No, thank you. What exactly is going on? I'm starting to feel extremely uneasy. He wraps his arm around my shoulders and invites me to accompany him in the office to inspect the new CCTV system. Okay, that's okay. The office has evolved. The sales data are posted in bold red letters on the wall, along with a downward arrow 
and a sad face drawn on it. A catalog with a new fridge freezer highlighted is on the desk, and on the computer is an email from head office stating that they have not been awarded the funding for a new fridge freezer, but the document has been zoomed in so it can be seen from two feet away. The boss takes my seat. It's great to see you back in town. Nova, our best friend, did she tell you about our fridge breaking down? No, she did not. I responded. Everything is coming together in my head. I can see what's coming. So I've heard from the staff that you've made some money, and I was wondering if you wouldn't mind purchasing us a new one since you were such an important member of the team to us all here. It would be quite beneficial, you know. We had five refrigerators at the restaurant. They would frequently break down, forcing us to shift the goods among the other fridges. It was a pain in the buttocks, but we'd have to make do. Back in 2011, it released large refrigerators and freezers, which my employer budgeted for, but instead spent on updating the workplace and computer. That's why head office rejected him for a new budget and told him he have to pay for it himself. I don't believe what has just been requested of me, but the voice of my inexperienced adolescent self begins to shout within me. Here is your chance. I grin. I thought a better idea. I reach inside my bag, pull out my purse, and reach for my credit card, but instead move my hand aside and raise my middle finger up in his face. Why not go for it yourself? I walk out and fall into tears, relieved to finally be able to tell my boss where he can stick it. The second story is money receipt. Then what about the money? What about no? My grandfather was not a wealthy guy by any means, but he worked hard for many years was always frugal with money and carefully invested it. He lived comfortably in retirement, and when he died, he left a trust fund in the low six figures. The trust stipulated that the fund's interest be paid to his wife, my stepmother, for the rest of her life. When she died, the trust was to be divided among his children and grandchildren in predetermined percentages, with the trust covering all taxes and expenditures. After my step-grandmother died, I received a letter from the bank that held the trust informing me that I would be receiving a few thousand dollars from the distribution of my grandfather's trust. All they asked was that I notarize the included receipt document and submit it back. To be specific, the receipt stated, I here be acknowledged receiving a check in the amount of $3,456.78 from Banco from the Phineas Key McGillicuddy Trust. To be more specific, they wanted me to notarize a declaration stating that I had already received the supposed check before they would send it. The names of individuals, banks, and dollar amounts have been changed. I interviewed three notaries, two bank executives, and the district attorney. They were all in agreement that they had never heard of such a thing. The DA stated that it was not unlawful, but rather unusual. I called the bank and spoke with the trust officer. Ellie, the bank lady, informed me that I was not comfortable submitting them a notarized paper verifying the receipt of cash that I had not received. She insisted, claiming that it was simply their policy. Her reasoning was that if they delivered the check without a receipt to indicate I received it, they couldn't prove they sent it. My rationale was that if I sent them a receipt first, and then the check didn't arrive for whatever reason, I'd be screwed because they'd have a notarized document saying that I had indeed received the check. We went around and around, and I promised to drive 120 miles at one point. Ellie stated that even if I were present in person, she would still require me to sign the receipt before handing over the check. I eventually caved. I had some unforeseen bills at the moment and needed the money to fill a hole before I fell into it. So I gritted my pride told my beliefs to bend, sent over her notarized receipt, got my check, and took care of business. Ellie wrote me another letter a few months later. They appeared to have miscalculated some taxes and distribution-related fees, and as a result, each beneficiary received a second, considerably lesser dividend. It was around 90 in my instance. All I had to do this time was have the included receipt notarized, indicating that I had received a check for 87.65 from Banco, from the Phineas Key McGillicuddy Trust. 
I could afford to stand on principle over 90 now that my money hole had been filled. And this time, I stood firm. I called Ellie again and told her that I was not comfortable signing a receipt claiming that I had gotten a check that I had not. She insisted, saying it was just their policy and was rather rude about it. I hung up and called back, asking for the name of that lady's supervisor as well as the highest ranking person in command at that location, who turned out to be Banco's president. Sweet. I mailed a letter to BL, CC, our supervisor, and CC, the president of Bank Co, borrowing directly from their letter and receipt document, I demanded that they send me a notarized duplicate of the attached receipt, indicating that they had received my notarized receipt, acknowledging that I had gotten a check in the amount of 87.65, and so on. I stated that once I had their notarized receipt, I would immediately send them my notarized receipt. I explained that it was simply my policy. These three letters were sent by certified mail. A return receipt was requested. I received return receipts from the post office a few days later, confirming that all three letters had been delivered to their proper recipients. A few days later, I received an envelope from Ellie containing the 87.65 check. Ellie or anybody else at Banco made no more comments. The final narrative is using store rules to exact petty revenge. I just had a talk with my mother in which she called me a jerk for refusing to sell alcohol to a student in my class. So I knew he was over the legal drinking age when he came to buy it, if only she had known the complete tale. This person with the same name as me was quite friendly to me in high school. But I discovered that he had affection for me. He was a gay man, or bi, I'm not sure. But I informed him that I was not interested. After all, I didn't swing that way. In reaction, he went on to ruin my high school life by catching him staring at me as I was changing for giant class. To get away from him, I had to change into a shower cubicle, spreading stories that I was still in the closet and other such nonsense. Was not only unpleasant, but also made me more of a target for bullying than I already was. I wasn't popular in the first place since I didn't agree with what everyone else was doing. And because he was, or claimed to be, gay or bi, he was taking advantage of affirmative action. If I brought it to the attention of a teacher, call me homophobic. No, I was just afraid of him. I was frequently chastised for my lack of tolerance. I was really relieved when he graduated in his fourth year. I stayed for another two years to further my education. I then worked on the tills of a supermarket to pay my way through college. This guy walks up one fateful day with a bottle of cheap alcohol in hand. It was probably Lambrini or something. I see him open his wallet and make a disgruntled motion as he realizes he neglected to bring his ID. He then notices me at the checkout and cracks the biggest smile, and I'm aware of his strategy. He arrives at my checkout. I don't recall the actual conversation, but it went something like this. Him. How are you doing? I pretended not to notice him. Hello, I'm fine, and thank you. Yourself. On the conveyor belt, reaching for the bottle. Is that everything for today? Him. Yes, Anok. Tonight I'm meeting up with a couple of friends. Me. That's great. Do you have a photo ID? We have a challenge 25 policy in this supermarket chain. If the person appears to be under 25, we request identification to verify their age. I knew we were the same age because he was in my senior year of high school. I was about 20 years old at the time. Him. I don't require identification. You are aware of my age. Me. Sir, I'm afraid I don't. I can't sell you alcohol unless you show me you're over the age of 18. He spoke loudly to gain my supervisor's attention. We were in the same school year. Me, were we? At this moment, the supervisor joined me. According to our business policy, the supervisor or manager must support the staff member because the person who sells the alcohol is liable, as is the store. I didn't need to say anything at this point. She handled it brilliantly, as she always did. Supervisor. What exactly is the issue here, sir? Him. 
He refuses to sell me my drink. He knows who I am and that I am over the age of 18. Supervisor. Sorry, sir, but he did want identification from you. We won't be able to continue the sale if you don't present it. He stormed away, leaving the bottle at my checkout. My boss later summoned me to her office about the event after he complained, and I repeated the homophobic statement from school. Such an accusation may have resulted in disciplinary action or termination. Fortunately, the supervisor came with me and supported me, claiming that the reluctance to sell the inexpensive drink was the sole cause. Such grievances were prevalent. I had forgotten about him at school. After all, I didn't want to go to jail for selling alcohol to a kid. But boy, it felt amazing to finally strike back at him in some way. Even this minor win was satisfying.